Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, so happy to have this panel assembled, which is a near miracle given the week, uh, especially that Joe and Kennedy have each had, um, and maybe, maybe Amir as well. Um, we have assembled to solemnly discuss the issue of NFTs and money laundering, or perhaps we should say anti-money laundering, <laughs> um, and steps we can take to avoid it and stop it from happening. Um, the trigger for the timing of this talk, which is being co-hosted by Canvas Art Law, which is a new um, art law and heritage law firm set up in London based in Somerset House, and Art AML, represented by Susan, who you can see on screen, which is an art world compliance platform. Um, the timing of this platform is driven by the fact that the UK government is currently consulting on, amongst other things, whether the current anti-money laundering regime that applies to the physical art world should also be extended to digital artworks. Um, I am thrilled to have this panel, so in no particular order, um, and perhaps the, the order I can see. So I'm going to first introduce my co-host, Susan Mumford, who goes by Susan J. Mumford, because there's a very successful massage therapist who's called Susan Mumford, so we need the J. Um, Susan, had formerly a gallerist herself, um, is the founder and CEO of Art AML. Um, hello, Susan. Hello. Delighted to be here. And then moving down, we have Kenny Schachter, who is a writer, curator, artist, lecturer. And in fact, I happen to know you were once a lawyer, weren't you? So you also have that, um, perhaps you have that mind as well, but you're definitely wasted in the law. So I'm pleased you're doing what you're doing now and not doing that. And Kenny's joining us from New York. Um, New York's gain is definitely London's loss. I met Kenny in London a few years ago when he lived here, but sadly he's now relocated to the US, but he is, can be found all over the place. Um, Joe Kennedy is one of the co-founders of Unit London um, and therefore the new Institute NFT platform. Joe is looking healthier than any of us because he's joining us from the Greek island of Kos. Um, so Thanks very much for going above and beyond joining from holiday or at least um, and especially the day you've joined after the week you've had with the launch of the Institute platform. And last but certainly not least, um, Amir Soleimani, who is a uh, art collector, both physical and digital, and is also a, an entrepreneur um, in the art world and a gallerist, and is joining us from Liverpool, which is where I'm from originally. So welcome, Amir. Um, firstly, I thought it would be good to kick off just by each of you guys talking about the week you've had and what you've just done. Um, so Kenny, I know that you have barely slept for the past two weeks. Um, what have you been doing in the NFT space in the last 10 days? Well, I helped institute and to curate the, the probably the biggest NFT show to date in London, which opened a few weeks ago, just a little bit more than two weeks ago. And that's where I met Amir, who was a visitor. <laughs> we had a dinner there. So it's a nice circle here. And I met you at a lecture I gave at the Courtauld some years ago in London. So after curating the show at Institute, which I've written about in an article that I just dropped today on on Artnet, there was a line around the block for the opening. It was one of the greatest successes, I think, in the space to date because of all of our coordinated work. Then from there, I went to Basel and I helped to organize the first NFT show ever in an art fair at Art Basel. But even more significantly, later the day, at the same day as the opening of Art Basel, I released an NFT project, which I introduced this notion of like, of an arts club and the NFT is entree into the club with a very low barrier of entry because I, I hate private clubs and sold 9,000 NFTs in a little more than an hour. And it's amazing because I'm self-taught in art and the same day that was the pin what should have been by far the pinnacle of my art life, which was being in the Basel Art Fair with my own works at Nagel Draxler Gallery, I, I had this success that I never could have dreamt possible and 
just I found out about NFTs a little over a year ago and nothing has been the same since. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And that's it. Thank you. Well, it's, as I say, it's a miracle that you are here. So thanks very much for, for joining us. And Joe, uh, you've just launched the Institute platform. How's that gone? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm here in Greece at the moment, which is which has been one of the most interesting and bizarre holidays of my life because the last seven days have been, well, to be honest, the last the last sort of six months since we sort of ideated the platform initially up until I really all came to a head last night at the close of the auction. Um, Kenny Kenny came on board to curate the exhibition, which, as he said, it's, it's been one of the most kind of uh, interesting and like educational experiences for us as a gallery team moving into the NFT space um, and negotiating this kind of this new world of, of, of collectors, this entirely kind of novel community of um, NFT buyers, really a lot of whom, you know, aren't necessarily associated with the art world and kind of um, are looking for a revolution really. And, you know, looking to do their own thing and not sort of ascribe to the values of, of what the art world kind of holds up. Um, as gospel so it's been it's been a fascinating couple of uh well like i say six months since we started and um this week has just been overwhelming really i mean last night in particular was just overwhelming we had our server pretty much crashed uh just at the close of the auction with the, the volume of traffic that we had um there was bids flying in like multiple bids per second and just like the server couldn't handle all of the the activity so it's been a really like interesting interesting experience and the the community um of collectors and artists in the nft space a lot of a lot of whom well the, you know kenny and amir have played a huge part in kind of cultivating um is just so refreshing so different to the art world so open so honest authentic it's just an incredible community so um we're just thrilled to have created just something kind of small which is which feels like it's it's having a real impact within the space um even though it's early days great well thank you for joining as well and finally um amir what's what what have you been up to the last week in um the metaverse oh well um last week i mean it wasn't any different i mean there is no difference between my last week and last two years right um um, up, since I started to build this gallery in Liverpool, it, each and every day was stressful. Uh, a lot of things need to be done. I had to deal with a lot of, uh, of, 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 of things for the, starting the gallery, dealing with other issues. Um, last week in particular was interesting because uh, I was able to get, I mean, one of the artists in fine art space is Hush that I love. I absolutely love and adore him. And I was able to get his Genesis drop on, on Joe's platform. And that was unbelievable. That uh, it was sort of a, a shock for me to understand that the, the, the collectors in the NFT space, um, there is a lot more for them to learn. There's a lot more for them to understand. There's a lot more room for education in this space. These people need to be educated. They need to learn what the artists, who, who those fine art artists are. So yeah, I mean, the last week was really interesting. We have an exhibition coming on in 12th of October. Fuchsia's will gonna come visit our gallery in Liverpool. Hopefully Joe will join us. Um, Kenny hopefully will fly from New York to Liverpool <laughs> and John and Susan, you're all welcome to come to join us in this exhibition. Fuchsia's and other artists will come to Liverpool. I think it's, it's amazing for the city and it's amazing for this space as a whole and in, for the UK as well. So I'm so stressed, overwhelmed, but hopeful that it's going to be okay. Great. Well, yes, you're, you're also looking remarkably fresh, given the circumstances. Right. I'm now going to put us into panel mode because um, I can see that that's possible and I've never done this before. So hold on to your hats while I put us into. There we go. That's um, that's terrifying. I don't know if I can turn to my <laughs> side. Um, and just as a bit of housekeeping for anyone who is on the line live, um, we do have the Q&A function um, open. 
So if you want to ask a question for any of the panelists, do put it in the Q&A and then we'll try and get back to it at the end if we can. And the other thing to say is that this is being recorded. So if you want to stay anonymous or pseudonymous, then please take the necessary steps for that to happen. Um, right, so we've established that it's an exciting moment for NFTs, and I definitely agree with Amir that it's a steep learning curve. I've had a horrendous cold for a few days, which has meant that I've had the time to be deep in Kenny's Discord for the Crypto Mutts project. So I should definitely declare an interest and say I own two mutts. And so I obviously think everyone should go out and buy those immediately. Um, but we are here to talk about money laundering or stopping money laundering. And so I'd first like to go to our expert, Susan, just to, um, for those on the call who perhaps don't know what money laundering is, perhaps you could give us a brief overview of what it is and why it's so important as a society that we stop it. Absolutely. And as a what I call a recovering art dealer, I do like to talk about some of the benefits to starting with what, what money laundering is. It's basically the concealment of the origins of legally obtained money. That can be by the means of transfers involving foreign banks or legitimate businesses. So I'll tell you just a quick bit about what it really means for the art world. We do have the understanding that as other sectors have been regulated over the decades, the art market has been increasingly targeted by criminals essentially. And without the familiarity with compliance and not previously being directly regulated, we might be indirectly regulated already, but now directly regulated with us in the UK and some other locations, it makes art businesses easy prey because even now people are, are struggling to understand how to take what's called a risk-based approach. It is important to emphasize this is not about art businesses doing money laundering themselves, not that at all. Um, it's about actually art businesses being targeted by criminals. So the three primary ways that money is laundered in the art market are one buying art with dirty money and selling it or using it as loan collateral either way it's cleaned the second piece is facilitating the purchase or sell of forged or stolen art that kind of relates to something in the UK called the proceeds of crime act and number three is buying art to improve your status as a criminal and I think it's worth stating that the UK's national risk assessment from the year 2020 stated that although there's still a, a complete, there's a lack of complete understanding of the mitigations and vulnerabilities in the art market as we're a newly regulated sector, it's the ability to conceal the beneficial owners and the final destination of art that make it particularly attractive for money laundering. And so anybody in the audience who's familiar with multi party transactions will realize you don't always know where art is going. You don't always know who the owners necessarily are. The reason that the National Risk Assessment identified the art market as being high risk is the use of offshore trusts and the use of intermediaries. That makes me immediately think of the newly released Pandora Papers and rollover Panama Paper, frankly. Uh, the value of art is subjective and prices vary. So high value pieces can conceal funds and then subjective valuation means that there can be market, market manipulation. A real life example, I know an artist who had a piece for the equivalent of 250 quid as an NFT, and then somebody pretty quickly after buying it, they put it back on for a million pounds. So he didn't think it would sell, but you know, it's not, not unusual for that to, to happen. The international nature of the art market also attracts those who want to move funds around the world. And then with art physically often being easy to move alongside fake shipping documents and other forged items, you can pretty readily facilitate criminal activities. In terms of why as a society it's important that we stop money laundering, it means that we prevent criminals such as you might think sex traffickers, terrorists, pretty horrible stuff from using art businesses to launder the funds from such illicit activity. And AML checks that, that art art market businesses are conducting now, in some jurisdictions at least, they prevent businesses from being targeted in the first place. And then they help to identify suspicious activity when it does occur. And personally speaking, I mean, that is, that is so far removed from the whole origin of art and the purpose of the makers. And what we hope at RTML for sure that, that, that will result from AML checks being conducted, if we look at some of the positives, is attracting new money to the art market that's been turned off by headlines of recent years and also the certainty that art is actually finding good homes. 
so that's that's a change, especially in the UK, that the um, that the art market has had to adjust to the past few years by implementing these processes and procedures. Um, so yeah, how how has that gone from your experience? How has the art world kind of reacted to having to do these things? Oh well, I mean, the art world goes. Many people go through phases, perhaps shock, denial, gradual acceptance. So it is it is law now in the UK. It, it which came from an EU directive, the fifth anti-money laundering directive, which was to be implemented by EU member states by the 10th of January 2020. Some have implemented, some have not, and the individual pieces of legislation might vary. What I would say is that there is an understandable reluctance to actually do much about it. People might be aware of it, but it doesn't seem to some as though they necessarily need to, to do anything about it yet. We frequently receive telephone calls or emails from people, and I know quite a few dealers and advisors from over the years, and they'll go, oh my gosh, HMRC has now contacted me. Do I really need to do this, that, and the other? And we, and we say yes. But in our experience, when people start to get their heads around what they need to do and, and why they're doing it, it's actually much easier. And it starts to make sense because they realize actually it is possible to do these checks. It's not impossible. And they can still proceed with, with transactions. And I would say that quite often people know when, when something isn't quite right anyway, but doing the checks means that you are actually doing more investigation than you would have done. And frankly, a lot of our businesses just weren't aware of money laundering at all. And so didn't really know what to look out for in, in terms of red flags. The USA is undertaking a survey in 2021 to look at the relevance of art, mar of art market anti-money laundering legislation. And what we do know is that antiquities will be regulated um, for anti-money laundering. And that's the legislation is to, to be proposed by the 27th of December this year. But we don't even know what antiquities means yet. So it's really early days. We're sometimes asked about China being regulated for AML. We haven't heard anything at all. But one of the big challenges we have is not only the cultural impacts upon the art market. A lot. Of, some people say, I always know who my customer is. Other art dealers say, actually, if I know who my customers are, that's going to be the end of my business. It really, go, it really goes by extremes, but we don't have a level playing field at the moment for international transactions because some are re regulated, some are not. Some have differing pieces of legislation, slightly differing interpretations of the fifth directive. So we are at a big time of change with this at the moment, and we're just, we're just getting used to it in the art market. So thankfully, my experience is that for most protagonists in the traditional art world selling physical art, this is quite old news now. But one um, important question in the context of this evening's discussion is, do those rules as they currently exist apply to sales of digital art? The quick answer is no. Digital art is not covered at all at this point in time. And if you think about what we're basing the definition of a work of art on in the context of conducting anti-money laundering checks. This is, by the way, in the context of the EU, probably the UK money laundering regulations 2017. Um, so we base the definition on the VAT definition of a work of art that was created in 1994. Therefore, it didn't, it wasn't incorporated at that point in time. It hasn't been incorporated since. And furthermore, there is a current consultation taking place, which is essentially look, working towards an amendment towards the money laundering regulations that would be implemented in 2022. And they asked the question about digital art and should, be, and should digital art be incorporated into a work of art. And asking that question on its own points to the fact that it's not currently caught. And just to open a little can of worms when, with NFTs, and that'll take more of, of the later part of this conversation. NFTs, are they even digital art? You know, it might actually be crypto assets instead. So that's a whole other question and a really pretty complicated area in terms of how to, how to define it. Yes, yes. And it's, it's also interesting to me to see what's carved out of the current rules in terms of collectibles, which is a concept that becomes important in an NFT context. So anything like, you know, stamps, coins, silver spoons, whatever it might, desirable collectible items are carved out of the current rules as they relate to physical artworks uh, in the UK. And as you say, the, um, the reason 
that we've uh, thrown this together at such short notice um, or meticulously planned it is, um, is that the consultation in the UK does close on the 14th of October. And so partly we wanted to do this in time so that if anyone did want to respond to that consultation and make their voice heard, then um, you still have nine days in which to do so. I'm very distracted in this virtual office we have. I can see that there's a frame saying deliver happiness. Um, I'm not sure that any of us just deals with art, but, but so I just wanted to go to Amir because I did um, in support of Joe's Institute um, project on the 21st of September. And in that tweet, you said of Institute that they have a fantastic and easy to use KYC, know your client system, which I think is a must for a healthier NFT system. Um, could you say a bit about why, from a collector's point of view and from an entrepreneur's point of view, you think that um, a, K a KYC system is good for the, for the NFT ecosystem? Oh, thank you very much, John. Um, the, the issue that I see in the NFT space is that, I mean, not the issue, the, the, the big difference that I see in the digital art space and fine art space is that this space works with communities. Right. So one thing that we don't have, you don't have in fine art space is the great or big community of people who are supporting something in this space, being a collectible or a fine art piece, a digital art piece. When there are lots of people are, in, are involved, it's, it becomes easier for any bad actor to, to just manipulate the market, get advantage of those people, or do whatever they want, especially on collectibles. What we are seeing in this market is that someone comes with a great idea or great art, or even not a great idea and not a great art in terms of collectible, and they sell within minutes, millions of dollars, and they're gone, right? So that cannot happen in, the health, in a healthy space. All those people who are participating, who are issuing artworks who are making millions of dollars, they need to be known. Because otherwise, that, that's, that's the example that I was uh, uh, telling one of my friends is that, imagine tomorrow morning, someone knocks on your door from FBI or CIA or one of those authorities, and they say, you're under arrest on suspicion of supporting terrorism. You have no idea, you haven't done anything wrong. But they say, listen, that project that you participated or that work that you bought actually went to support terrorism or, or, some, or some other bad causes, right? So in order to protect people, this great and loving community in NFT space, we need to have KYCs, we need to have AMLs to just protect those people. Those people, they have no idea what, what can go wrong because they are there as a community, they are enjoying this space, this ride as per se, right? So that's why I, I think that in order to protect those people, we need to have proper KYC in this space. We need to have proper AML to just protect people's interests. I think that's, that's very well said. And it re reminds me of um, as a lawyer working in a regulated industry, when, when it's impressed on us as to why um, anti-money laundering processes are so important. You know, we're rightly proud of the legal sector in London as one of the most reputable in the world. And um, it would be a disaster for the reputation and integrity of that sector if it was seen to be a vehicle for, for, for cleaning money and laundering funds. And exactly the same in the NFT space. Ultimately, if it is to flourish, um, it, it, you know, it, it needs to have that reputation for integrity. Um, Joe, so you did an interesting thing in, um, in, in this gray area and these different rules and different places and different people giving different advice on what was required and what wasn't. You made the decision to implement um, this, what Amir describes as a fantastic and easy to use KYC system. Um, did you get any pushback from collectors and um, artists on your decision to do that? I have to say, so, so when, when the, the EU uh, AML directive came in, um, I think lots of galleries who, who already find it difficult enough to sell art, you know, this, I'm talking about smaller galleries, independent galleries, 
who just work their asses off to try and sell paintings. And when you're trying to sell a 15, 20,000 pound painting, it, be, it can be difficult um, to ask people to then jump through like these additional hoops, which in reality are pretty basic and pretty simple, but it's these little things that play in people's minds. Oh, I have to find a utility bill. Oh, I have to find this. I have to submit that. Sometimes that can be, that can make or break a deal for a gallery. Right. And um, so I think there's, there's a lot of, um, kind of like a lot of hearsay around AML and like these kind of heuristics. I think people kind of assume that it's this huge pain in the arse or it's massively difficult to do. Um, when we implemented our, when we kind of launched the platform and then implemented the KYC process, we had a lot of people like Amir and like a lot of other kind of big reputable collectors and artists within the space who were really um, behind the idea um, because it does signal, I think, an intention to, um, promote a healthy ecosystem and to, um, to kind of get rid of also all of the, the negative press around the crypto space. Anything that you hear that's kind of, um, you know, criticizing the space tends to be around the scams, um, the pump and dump schemes, um, and the propensity that the space has to just kind of facilitate those types of behaviors. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted to, we wanted to kind of make a mark and say, look, we want to onboard fiat users. If, if, if our customers want to pay with a credit card or bank wire, they're going to have to KYC. It's an obligation for us anyway, under the, under the AML act. Um, but there was, you know, there was a lot of kickback from the crypto community and there's obviously like a big focus on anonymity and pseudonymity within the space. And, um, I, I find it kind of, we were discussing this internally, but I find it kind of, um, ironic that a space which is built upon, transparency of the blockchain um and openness and uh, is is also kind of housing this this crazy like an anonymity and sort of um pseudonymous users where nobody knows who these big buyers actually really are um so obviously you know it, there's there's a huge kind of like moral and ethical question here around like should we allow the potential for these schemes to happen within the industry do we want to be a part of that um and then um, the second part, I think, is just educating people about, you know, the importance of AML, why it's needed. Um, it's certainly not put in place in order to kind of give away information on who's buying what. It's much more just about protecting the community um, and protecting ourselves as a business, protecting our collectors, protecting our artists. Um, so I think there's also an education piece that, that has to happen around AML, which is something that I've gone through over the last kind of two years since we've implemented these um, new processes in the gallery. But I think the education part will will go a long way to kind of turn people's heads. It's, it seems to be more of like a an ideological issue for people where they're just like, no KYC, that's old school. Like this is the crypto world where we value anonymity. This is how we do things. Don't bring those rules into our space. But I think, you know, as the space matures and develops um, as it is right now, I think it's going to become really just a question of, of inevitability. And as you say, there's nothing inherent in operating those checks that means that anyone has to surrender their right to pseudonymity as they present on the public platforms. Right. You know, that's something that you can process confidentially and securely. And, you know, yeah, it doesn't mean unmasking people who don't want to be un unmasked. Um, but ultimately, uh, you have to be able to follow transactions around chains and everyone has to be confident that the end destination of those funds and those assets isn't in, in, involved in the illicit activity that Susan described um, vividly earlier on. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask Kenny, perhaps the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the ultimate philosophical question in this area, which is which NFTs are art and which are not? And is, is that a distinction that you find sort of culturally important, someone who's been steeped in the history of art for three decades? Well, first, just to touch base on the Know Your Client AML situation. Yeah, please. I mean, one of the, the issue is greed is part of human nature and uh, you can have all the regulation you want, but if someone is trying to skirt an issue, they're going to get around it. So, you know, anonymity and this kind of cowboy girl mentality of the crypto world, I just think that 
there's a bell's curve of integrity and morality in the world. And if people are intent to break the law or to launder money, they're going to figure it out how to. And it, I don't think it's going to be terribly difficult. So uh, I think it's great that there's going to be, of course, the crypto world is going to be ultimately regulated as are all the other economies and sectors of the economies. So that's, it, it's inevitable, but Again, like there's no way to completely abolish this type of behavior where someone is intent on breaking the law or, but anyways, and back to intent, I mean, what's art and what's not is really a matter of intent of the maker and the creator. So, I mean, what I love so much about it, I don't really go into the NFT space looking to make fine line determinations about what it is that I'm looking at, what it is I'm even buying sometimes or making for that matter. I mean, I made this project, Crypto Mutts, which was really, it's kind of blurs the distinction of what it even is. I'm not even sure what it is. I mean, is it my art? To some extent, it's my art. I make art and is it, it's different from anything I, I've ever made before. It's a series of 10,000. So I've done editions and I've done multiple uh, objects. I also wanted it to operate on different levels. So according to who I was trying to, to, to persuade or dissuade or argue with, or what the benefits or the non-benefits were from a tax perspective or from uh, some regulatory issue, you, I, I could explain these things that I made into, it, I could say they're art, and I could just as well make an argument that they're not art. So what I love about art is that art is anything and everything. It all depends on what the intent is. But as someone who just conducted or completed this project, which I'm in the midst of defining, and already I have to keep in mind uh, SEC, securities and exchange issues. Am I creating a security? Am I Ultimately, I'm looking to create a token. I've trademarked the word NFTism because I think NFTs are nothing. An NFT is a smart contract, which is some kind of digital certificate of authenticity that piggybacks onto a Ethereum currency. So what is an NFT in the first instance? That's a, that question can occupy people for decades to come. Is it art? No, the art is on a URL. Rarely the art is on the blockchain itself. I wish it was all on chain. It would make it a lot simpler. But there are going to be so many, I mean, literally, this whole sector is opened up way billions of more questions than can ever be resolved uh, in this fine boom panel room we're sitting in, wood panel, panel room. But, you know, I just, it's so vague. And, and I mean, it's just like in the 60s, there was an issue like, is a Dan Flavin um, fluorescent light fixture is it a sculpture or is it a light fixture? Well, it's it's both. <laughs> it depends who you're trying to persuade and why. So a lot of NFTs are art, a lot of them are collectibles. Is there a difference? It's not really, it just depends <laughs> what, again, like what, what you're trying to prove or what your intent is. So I don't think these issues will ever be resolved, honestly. And what I love is the ambiguity of it all. I don't really care. I just love, I love this kind of, yeah, operating in the interstices between, you know, it's something new. Sure, I mean, I don't think digital art is not art. That's ridiculous. Of course it's art. Digital, it's been digital art since the 50s and generative photography. There's a great deep history. This is not just something that landed from Mars, what we're doing in the NFT space. Although NFTs may have just kicked off the end of 2017 uh, and the market in earnest only over the last year or less than two years, but uh, we're in new territory and the government's got a lot of catching up to do. And it's not gonna be easy for us as makers, as sellers, as curators, as collectors and dealers. It's not gonna be easy for the authorities to get their arms around it. It's just not gonna be easy. And it's gonna be very difficult to enforce. I just sold 9,000 NFTs. I don't know the identity. I think initially there were 2,000 buyers or something you know, around that number. I don't know the identity of 85% of them. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> something you've said in the, in the last week made me laugh, which is um, 
you've worked for multiple bosses before, but now you have 2,100 bosses, each giving you their view on what it is you should be doing to, uh, to promote this project. Um, yeah, a couple of things you said there what remind me of, um, well, we, the Turner Prize for Contemporary Art has just opened in the UK. And of course, the five nominees are five collectives, five communities making social work rather than art objects. And so that the definition on the, on the outer boundaries of what is art and what isn't is also happening in it, outside the, the, the crypto space as well. Um, but, and like you, I, I, I don't, I think you can spend too much time um, stressing over the definitions unless you need to define it for some reason in law as sometimes comes up in, what I, in my day job. And this is one of the reasons why I raised that point of classification in this context is that determination on whether or not an NFT is art or it isn't has the potential to this determine whether or not it is included within money anti-money laundering rules or whether it isn't. And um, one of the things that is frequently said in this area is that um, we're right at the beginning of use applications for NFTs. Art happens to have been the one of the earliest use cases, but actually we might see NFTs change our lives in ways we're not even yet, we can't even yet think about. And so thinking about which NFTs NFTs are art and which are not is likely to become a more frequent exercise, I would say. Um, but in, in, in this context, um, perhaps back to you, Susan, like this distinction between which NFTs are art and which aren't. I mean, that um, in the context of this consultation that the UK government is running, that's right, isn't it? That if we decide something is art, that might be the thing that drags it into an AML regime. Right. And I, I think to start with, what's what I find one of the things I find so fascinating is that I mean, like everyone I'm sure attending this conversation today, my inbox is just so full of various NFT platforms launching, art fairs doing NFTs, art marketplaces doing NFTs, galleries doing NFTs. So the space is hugely growing. And as, as you were rightly saying, John, it just so happens to have seemingly started at least largely for the in the media context with art so to specifically answer the question that you just asked really it's it's probably a uh, I would actually say it goes far as say it's a mistake to classify nfts as, as being art in the sense of what what nfts are it's a vehicle for art they're they're crypto assets some of which relate to art it could be many other things as well and it does seem likely perhaps and doubtful that crypto assets will become more regulated and that would probably lead to nfts being subject to higher scrutiny and due diligence requirements than art an interesting point here as well that i that was occurring to me when when you were previously speaking as in as several of you was uh, about actually not wanting to know the identity of people that i'm that, i mean that heart Harks to an, a previous era to my mind. What we see at RTML is often generational differences, where, where people who are more into know, kind of contemporary art are actually much more comfortable with transparency. So it's this really interesting dichotomy that is that is taking place. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the trend that pulls in the, in the other direction is the idea that um, if you can exist as an avatar in the metaverse then you can live sort of this second life that is parallel to the life you have to endure on our physical capitalist planet and for some people it's an important escape <laughs> and one of the um as i've spent some time observing um various nft communities i'm um, and that that word community is sprinkled around so liberally but um one of the things that binds the participants together is this shared excitement that they're doing something that's ludicrously risky in terms of you know return on investment and and that isn't um a bug of this area it's a feature because they are believers the ones who are prepared to take that leap and and participate in that risk and the others in their nine to five are the normies who haven't got the appetite or the stomach for that at all and so the fact that the participants at the moment do have the stomach for it is one of the things mm. that unites them, which is um, something that's, that's interesting to me as, as people enjoy this, 
this sort of parallel life you can have in the NFT world. Um, anyway, that became a bit more abstract than I was, that was planning. Um, and John, yeah. I just thought, I, I realized I didn't completely answer your question, which is to say that with regard to the, to the definition of say digital art or what NFTs fall, fall under again, for those people who are going to partake in the consultation and, and, and anyone in the art world, well, um, involved, I guess, in the UK art world is, is welcome to, to respond to that. Uh, that is in the consultation at the moment and it's section 2.33. If you turn to that and you can see box two and it has, it actually has a specific question about digital art and the last paragraph just above it actually says what the current definition of digital art is. It doesn't mention NFT, but people can certainly comment upon it. There's a section on crypto asset in chapter six. Yes, and I agree that, that, um, that not only the definition of digital art, but the definition of crypto asset is yeah. something that is going to yeah. be an increasing area of focus. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm, I'm sure that this isn't how the term NFT started, but it might easily have been invented as something that specifically evaded previous wording to do with um, AML attention, because what the Financial Action Task Force, which is a, a global initiative, identified last year was... Um, uh, it changed the wording from focusing on fungible crypto assets. So the, the wording previously specifically said, what we're interested in is fungible um, digital assets, because those are the things we think are a risk. They've now changed that wording, presumably in response to the non-fungible world taking off. But um, So I'm not saying that the term NFT was, was originally coined as a way of evading um, previous AML initiatives, but uh, you know it, it could have been. Um, we've heard a few things about why digital art um, and physical art might be attractive to people wanting to launder money, and this this idea of subjective value is perhaps the um, the main thing. And and it's so difficult watching NFT markets in flow um, to ascertain why one sale has happened and why one price has been reached um, in one case and not another. And do, do, do you think digital art presents a greater risk than physical art in, in money laundering? Definitely. And, and to a certain extent, you so, can see it as, as a... Because it's, because it's so new and because the value is so subjective. Yes. Well, I mean, the answer to that is yes. It, it definitely presents a greater money laundering risk. You could kind of see it as a contemporary version of, of cash even, um, not knowing actually where, where it came from. And payment with cryptocurrencies is really common. A, an artist I was recently speaking with who had sold a piece, I remember him going, oh, well, it kind of translated or converted to this particular amount at that particular time. So actually pinning down the, the value in relation to say existing currencies def definitely does present its challenges and and arguably as well in terms of NFTs is what you were mentioning about kind of the subjectivity of the of the valuation, et cetera. Um, but also they're often acquired without actually even being viewed. I was I was hearing about one particular cell that had taken place where people were creating user accounts and kind of having and they could buy 10, 10 pieces at a time where you could go straight to the smart contract. And you could also, they, they were basically writing scripts and people who were trying to buy through the web interface were not actually able to, able to purchase them. And, and so the whole thing wasn't even about art. So you kind of go, well, then um, where, where, do you, where do you go with that? Yeah, um, I, I, I know those bots definitely exist because I've had automated bots making me offers already. <laughs> on, the two, on, the, on, the, on the two crypto nuts that I have oh. and, the, and the, they, they offered way too little. So um, I'm, I'm holding on, I'm in, I'm in for the long haul, Kenny. But um, <laughs> just to ask all of you, um, whether you have personally seen anything that suggests to you that NFTs are currently being used for money laundering, or is that um, the easiest lazy insinuation for people from the traditional art world to make if they just want to express hostility to something they don't yet understand? So anyone can take that if you... Have you seen anything that suggests that's happening? Can I, can I go with something? There are some points that we need to consider. Like, first of all, the, the, there is a huge difference in NFT space, and is that in finance space, you need to AML buyers 
right? But in this space, you need to do that on creators, right? Because those are people who are making the most money, right? So we need to understand how this space works. Like you need to focus on creators. The other thing is, uh, I just wrote some, some uh, points that we need to mention. The other thing is clearly governments, they're terrible at, at, at doing and uh, creating proper and practical rules over, especially for NFT space. Why? Because as I said before, the NFT space is run by the community and that's important, right? If, if you decide to just put a label of crypto assets, because when you say crypto, it means, oh, that thing that all the banking system is against, right? And then you need to regulate it because it's crypto. No, it's not crypto asset. Crypto is a tool in this technology, in this sort of new medium. We need to understand those as well. And yes, we've seen a lot of issues in this space. They, they, they call the rock pullings. People are coming, they create lots of collectibles and then they're gone. The next day they're gone. They, they, they've been doing that in, uh, in cryptos like tokens and now they are doing that in, in, in collectibles as well. But again, one thing that we need to understand is that we cannot have one set of rules like AML in general, and then we just add NFTs to them. No, it needs to be something different, something specifically created for this digital world because the economics are different, how people interact in this world are different. They, 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 there are creators, there are buyers, there are traders, there are flippers, there are supporters, and the use cases are hugely different in art world. So my suggestion is, first of all, I mean, it's not a, a simple case of adding the NFTs into AML or bringing AML into NFT. No, it's not as simple as that. You need to understand this space. You need to understand how this space works. You need to understand, first of all, why you're doing the AML. Are you going to protect the people or are you going to protect the interest of the governments? These are two different things. I believe that we need AML to do both, protect people and protect the general interest of, of, of safety, global safety. Yes, we need to do that, but not by doing AML on, on people like buyers. No, that's a different story. You need to do that on creators because they are the one who are creating, the, are making the most money. So I just wanted to mention those points and I'm done speaking. Thank thanks, thanks, Amir. Uh, Joe, Kenny, I mean, you must have it said to you all the time. It's all just money laundering, isn't it? It's, what's the fuss about? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, interesting, like for us as a platform, I mean, our, our, our legal obligation is actually to KYC the sellers or the creators, as Amir said. So anybody that actually comes onto our platform and is selling something, because the platform commission comes from the seller's uh, proceeds, we have a legal obligation to know where the funds that we receive as a platform come from. So, so actually our obligation is to make sure that anybody selling on our platform, i.e. the artists or any collectors who are reselling, have done their appropriate KYC. That's our legal obligation. Um, in terms of buyers, because, because the, the NFT platforms are set up, as, as Amir said, they're community-led and they're, they're really like just trading platforms a la Etsy or Amazon or um, eBay. Like it's, just, it's a very similar type of structure whereby uh, as galleries, you will represent the artist and you will, you will warrant in a transaction, you're representing the artist, you will charge VAT to the buyer on behalf of the artist. You'll undergo all the AML obligations that you have to, um, that you have to go through on behalf of us and on behalf of the artist. As a platform, you're really saying, well, we're, we're providing the infrastructure for an artist or a seller to enter into a transaction with a buyer. Um, we're not necessarily a party to that transaction. We just take a commission from the sellers. So it's, it's like a very different structure. And, um, and actually, I think raises just some interesting questions around. I mean, I don't know of any artists at the moment or creators who have been charging BAT, for example, on, on sales. Um, but depending on how we define NFTs or digital art, whether if they fall under a definition of artwork, then those sales would be subject to VAT. 
And therefore, if the platforms aren't charging VAT on behalf of those artists or sellers, it's actually the, the artists themselves who will have those VAT obligations. Do they exist? Like, I don't think anyone really knows right now, but I don't think the artists themselves are, are even necessarily aware of the tax obligations, um, which falls a direct result of the, you know, the, the sort of lack of clarity or definition around what an NFT or digital artwork is. Because if it's a financial asset, then it's not subject to VAT. If it's a, if it's a work of art, then it is. So, um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of our legal obligations are really around like how we treat the, the sellers on our platform and not the buyers. And as Amir said, generally the, the way that the commissions are structured is um, the, the platform takes a, a much smaller cut than the, than the seller. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'd agree with Amir there. I just think it's very important for, for the people who are creating works to make sure that, um, well, I think that's when most of the opportunity to make a lot of money basically stands with the sellers. Brings us nicely on to Kenny. Kenny, what, what, what do you think? Um, from my limited experience of the NFT space is that it's far too risky and volatile for the average money launderer. Well, I mean, first of all, I, it's, it's bewildering the issues that we're talking about. I'm sitting here thinking like for the first time, just the, I mean, I think that most people in this space, we don't even know how to report money that comes into a, a digital wallet. A meta, I don't even know, like, I mean, money comes, the taxable consequences are already uh, transpiring. When I'm, There's so many unknowable, unanswerable, unresolved questions. I mean, I don't even know how to, how to treat the money coming into my wallet, uh, yet the issue of sales tax from all of the buyers, I have no idea who these buyers are. They're, they're anonymous wallet addresses that are coming. I mean, it's just... You know, I'm glad I don't work for the IRS because uh, besides the obvious reasons, but these are just, these are unknowable questions and they're gonna, there's gonna, we, we need a whole regime of government employees that are 15 to 20, 20 years old to, to even understand what the hell is going on in the first instance. As far as me personally, like my art is so cheap, unfortunately, that I don't really, no one's going to abuse me for any money laundering issues because I'm not in that bracket of successful artists that, you know, significant sums of money are exchanging hands. These are just, you know, that's not even an issue. But as far as like, I mean, it's a giant, the, the whole notion that the art world is, you know, the biggest unregulated cesspool of corruption is, is absolutely absurd because as Georgina Adam, great FT, uh, columnist and author has stated there's a hundred and on average 160 plus laws that apply to any given art transaction in terms of like in the United States there's a uniform commercial code so just by selling something from one person to the other there are all sorts of regulations regarding fraud and misrepresentation and conveying title and so these things are inherently or you know there there's various statutes that apply to all of these transactions however in the crypto space it is the wild 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 west that i mean people are just even i had no before there was a practical application from my life in terms of art and non-fungible tokens i never paid attention to crypto at all because i'm not a money trader i make art and um, look, when it comes to fine art and you look at the fine art market, anytime something is worth more than more than a few thousand dollars, it becomes somehow an asset or a financial, to some extent, you know, a financial asset. And fine art, and if you look at high-end paintings like Picasso and expensive artworks, yeah, sure, you know, there, there are shenanigans that are going on with free ports and 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 tax evasion and money, these types of issues, again, they're extant, they exist. There's no way you'll ever resolve them no matter how much you regulate it because no, people will always circumvent regulations if they're so uh, criminally minded. Nothing will get around that. But I think right now in the, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a, I don't, I've never bought cryptocurrency in my life. Somebody chucked me a free Ethereum and that, was the launch pad for me to get started. But right now I just, I mean, I was lucky enough to be in a position to sell 
of, you know, not into the, I certainly didn't make into the millions of dollars, not even over a million, but money came in. And as far as how it has to be treated, I mean, money came into my wallet. So that's a taxable, uh, there are consequences for that. And I have to contend with that. Right now, when you fill out your taxes, there are no like crypto questions per se, but certainly there will be. And I have to report the fact that I had, you know, an income generating uh, transaction occur or met multiple. As far as like charging sales tax and all of these obligations and consequences, you know, I wouldn't even know how to go, how to start such an exercise, even to understand. I mean, I know there are some lawyers in the audience that will know a lot better than myself. And I'm gonna have to, as you know, it, it's amazing because, right? Like what you've, all of you have said before, like Amir and Joe, that this kind of, like it used to be you have an art dealer, you're an artist, the artist is this kind of subjugated person, frequently take advantage of. The art world is still 90% uh, non-contractually, you know, the relations between artists and dealers are mostly non-contractual. So what's really interesting is that now the artists, a lot of cases in making their work, they're now becoming the artist and the dealer for their own work. They're conflated, like these two disparate roles. And now, like, again, artists are famous for not being terribly, uh, I mean, we're not number crunchers and we're not terribly, you know, thorough when it comes to record keeping and all those types of where I am not personally, I could say, maybe I shouldn't in such a public context, but you know, there's a lot of shit that we're gonna have to get our, our heads around and our arms around. And it's gonna have to happen sooner than later because I think Institute was the first platform in the world to ever even have, you know, KYC on their, on their bidding uh, platform. And I was, I, and I was trying to, I was trying to, to register to bid as an artist in the show, the curator, and I also wanted to bid. And I was in London and I had a passport on hand, but I didn't have a utility bill. I couldn't even register. Mm -hmm. So of course I was probably one of many people to call up Joe and say, like, excuse my language, but what the fuck? I, I, I can't do the KYC. You want me to bid or not? You know, but I, I don't have what you're asking to comply. Yeah, you know, and that's I'm sure I wasn't alone. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's been my whole anyway, ML officer. I think these are the early days, and like, it's not going to be me. It's not going to be. We're going to have to have, you know, directives coming from authorities on how to navigate these convoluted, murky waters. And of yeah. course, people are going to come in and take advantage. And of course, criminal mind. This is like a gold mine for people that want to. To high profits and money and spend money illegally. I mean, that's why crypto probably started with the dark web on some level to, for drugs and various well, other things. <laughs> although we should make the point, on the other hand, that if you do want to launder money, the most obvious place to do that isn't on a publicly accessible blockchain. And so we should say that the trump card that this area has in notwithstanding how easy it is to have, you know, wallets that are anonymous, but, but nevertheless, you can follow things on the chain. And indeed, one of the things that was often said about the traditional art world is that there's price manipulation, um, you know, it's a, an insider's world. And of course, when there was some insider trading happening in NFTs recently, because someone at a platform knew what was going to be promoted ahead of time, the community was able to cry foul and saw that those transactions were happening and saw that that insider trading was happening. Um, and stop it. And so we, we could say that, the, the, the yeah, this is the great hope for this area, that the public blockchains will save us all. <laughs> I beg to differ. I think he just wasn't a clever criminal. I mean, that yes. was just sheer stupidity. Yes. I think, you look, you know, it could be the blockchain or anything else. If somebody wants to steal money, they're going to steal it. When lots of money is at stake and on the table, whether it's from a, a Van Gogh or Picasso or Monet or of people, if somebody is criminally minded, they're gonna skirt these issues. So yes, we have to be cognizant of them. Yes, right now we have a kind of a, a free pass because the governments haven't caught up to speed yet, but they're certainly going to because there's so much money at stake. And then we're just gonna to have to retroactively figure it out. Yeah. 
about 10 minutes ago, I saw Susan put her hand up to respond to something <laughs> Joe said. And in fact, I can now, I can now see it on screen as well. Um, so, Susan, what, what, what was the point you wanted to make about what Joe was saying? Um, and it slightly relates to a question that has just gone into, Q, into the Q&A Q room as well. Um, it's, and, and actually, Kenny, you were talking about Georgie and Adam writing about all of these pieces of legislation to do with any single transaction. One of the ways in which you have additional, I think, complexity for people in the, in the art market to actually understand compliance and, and understand what their obligations are is what is expected for what type of transaction and for, and for the people involved. And actually, we might find that in some instances, with say checking checking an artist, it actually may not be the money laundering regulations that apply, but in fact it could be the Proceeds of Crime Act, in which case you're looking at provenance and sanctions primarily, and any suspicious activity that was detected in addition to that. But is the person sanctioned or their company? And what and if if a piece is coming directly from the artist studio, whether digital or not, well, there's no question really about about that provenance. And yeah, and then I can see the question in the chat room is then about the KYC or AML on the creators wouldn't limit them for, or if there are care, if there are KRC or AML on the creators wouldn't limit them to for total freedom of expressions. So I'll hand that back over to you, John, but I feel like that kind of relates to what I was talking about too with with artists um, and what you think your own, your own obligations. If, we, if you look at an auction house, if they're having works consigned, they're actually looking at proceeds of crime act, whereas the buyers, they're looking at the money laundering regulations. So then you have to learn about all of that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And of course, it's something that is um, in another context in social media, people are asking every day, you know, should we do ID checks on people with social media accounts? Because otherwise they can spread hate and abuse or libel people. And so, should we all have to um, prove who we are and represent who we are online? It's, it's like, it's a big philosophical question and we're probably not gonna solve it now. Um, I think one theme that's come from what um, you've all been saying is that um, you know more regulation in this area is inevitable. And so one of the things, uh, one of the things that makes what Joe and Institute have done sensible, I think, is that you've kind of, grasp the nettle you've had that carnage in your voice messages joe this week but actually you've done it now and um at least you you know as you move forward people other people will probably move in your direction rather than away from it so you know i hope that that can be a virtue of your platform going forward that you've taken that step now um, and others will surely um, follow in time or be forced to follow and if the the industry only has more chance of being regulated and interfered with if it is seen to not be able to regulate itself and so um, I think the points that you and, and Amir have made about um, why that's a healthy thing for this ecosystem were absolutely right and um, we are running slightly over I have seen some so we've we've seen had a couple of questions and I've seen that um uh um, Amir has kindly stolen my thunder and answered an IP question. My, my, so my specialism is an, as an IP lawyer, um, but so that's maybe a, a conversation for another night. And of course, my um, the motivation that Susan and, and I have for running this session at all is fairly transparent in the sense that we want to advertise the fact that we are only a phone call away for anyone who has any of these issues. Um, I can see that some hands have been going up as we've been going through. So I don't know if anyone has a burning question. And I, what I would love to try is if we can get them to join the vacant seat on the edge of this row of five to <laughs> a, a, ask a question. I think that is possible. Did anyone who raised their hand that I missed, are you now brave enough to raise your hand again to put a question to this panel while you have this chance? See, that has inevitably scared everyone into wanting to maintain their anonymity. Um, okay, well, um, Thanks very much for giving us that much of your time. Um, Joe, enjoy the rest of your time in COS if you can. And I am being reminded in the room that we do have a poll here that I'm now going to launch. So our poll question is, should NFT platforms implement KYC checks? So if anyone in the audience has a view on that, we, uh, we would love to get your answers um, as we uh, take the temperature of what people in the I, audience think. Uh, Amir, I can see you've raised your hand with the final thought. Yeah, one thing that I wanted to mention is that <clears throat> I believe instead of governments coming into this space and try to regulate it, 
if we as a community in this space start to regulate ourselves, that would create more trust, more transparency, and more confidence in this space. How, I think a while ago, I put that tweet out that, how about we create a sort of watchdog in this space, right? A watchdog that just is careful what's happening, who is creating what, and just pr tries to protect interests of, of those normal people that are trying to enjoy this space, either by collecting art or collectibles. If we do that, because I, I believe that it's a very delicate situation in here because it's, it's, it involves cryptos and art. And these two are very interesting for any government. And what I also believe is that if you put more pressure on people in this space, eventually they're gonna do their thing. Eventually, they're going to be a black market for NFTs. And eventually, people are going to buy and sell on black markets. So while we have the option of maintaining that, that trust, maintaining that integrity, with the help of the community itself, it's going to be greater than a government intervening with all sorts of regulations uh, dictated to this space. So I wanted to point that as well. Thank you very much. Right. Oh, oh, and is that your is that your hand still up, Susan, or is that a new hand? It's a new one. To really to say very quickly in response to Amir that I agree with your concept about self-regulating. However, being embedded in in reality as we endeavor to be at RTML, we don't see people most doing this until they absolutely have to. So I think that's that's the challenge that we face. Okay. Right, I can, I'm pleased to announce the results of the poll are 68% of people saying yes, NFT platforms should implement KYC checks. So there you go, Joe, there's two thirds support for what you're doing. 15% uh, say no and 17% say they're unsure. Um, right, let's all go and buy crypto mats. Good evening, everyone. Bye. <laughs>